Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to the War Room podcast. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Whit, Professor of Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and the War Room podcast editor. Thanks for joining us for another episode in our Dusty Shelves series in cooperation with AHEC, the Army Heritage and Education Center here at Carlisle, where we explore stories about historical artifacts and apply them to present strategic thinking. Joining me today again is Dr. Conrad Crane, Chief of Historical Services at AHEC. We had so much fun the first time I asked him to come back for round two. I just couldn't keep myself away. (laughs) Couldn't, Couldn't stay away. Uh, So as you'll recall, this series is produced in collaboration with the Army Heritage and Education Center and aims to elucidate strategic history and theory and its enduring relevance through a close examination of important historical artifacts and documents. And so today we're going to be talking about a genre um, of document that all of us who work for the military are familiar with, perhaps painfully so, uh, the dreaded hand receipt. Uh, But this is a hand receipt sort of unlike any other, at least that I'm familiar with. Uh, So imagine that instead of signing for an office key or a new computer or even some other piece of very expensive equipment, uh, that you've just taken responsibility for the first atomic weapon that's going to be used um, in, in combat, in war. So with that... And this, this sort of epic hand receipt. Uh, can you describe, uh, Khan, the document for us? You know, what does it look like? Uh, what does it say? Um, and I'll note again, we're going to put an image uh, on the post on the War Room website so you can see it for yourself. This, well, this is a really, there's an interesting story behind a document as well. This is basically, like, like Jackie said, this is the hand receipt for the, uh, most of the structure of the Little Boy atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, The hand receipt actually was in the possession of Thomas Farrell, who was the deputy commander for the Manhattan Project. He actually kept it in his wallet for most of his life, and it it came to us late when when his collection was given to us by his family. So the document is, is, the actual document is very wrinkled. It's a kind of wrinkled yellowish sheet of paper, lots of signatures on it, lots of bureaucraties. uh, it it's, uh, looks kind of nondescript. It basically it looks like a typical hand receipt. It's from the headquarters of the First Technical Services Detachment in San Francisco. Um, it, it basically says to Brigadier General Farrell, subject receipt of material, original to be signed personally by the recipient, returned to the sender, duplicates to be retained by the recipient, triplicate retained by sender for suspense file. And then basically what he's certifying is that I have personally received from Dr. Norman F. Ramsey, Jr., the material is identified below. I assume all responsibility for the safe handling, storage, and transmittal of all of this material in accordance with existing regulations. The material, including closures and attachments, is identified as follows. The identifying material, avoid any reference which might cause the receipt form to be classified. That wasn't done very well because the, the actual annotation has been scratched out by classifiers later because it basically says project, projecto unit containing blank kilograms of enriched tube alloy, at an average concentration of blank. So it's not actually a, a mystery what this is what this is for. Uh, we just have some information redacted redacted later on. Yes. Um, so why why does a hand receipt exist for uh, for the the parts of the little boy bomb? Mm-hmm. Well, obviously this was to to, uh, to achieve accountability for this and its trip across the Pacific. What happens is that the it's actually on the, the, the little boy parts ship out of uh, port on the U.S. Indianapolis the same day the Trinity test goes off. The Trinity test is actually the fat man bomb, not the little boy bomb. The little boy bomb has actually never been tested in combat. Those pieces are shipped in Indianapolis. Indianapolis will make a record run across the Pacific. And, and it leaves on the 16th of July, actually arrives in Tinian Island on the 26th of July where the hand receipt is, 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 is created and, and presented. Uh, Dr. Parsons, Dr. Ramsey had actually gone all the way across the, uh, on the Indianapolis shepherding this, this piece of equipment. Uh, the pieces are signed over to uh, General Farrell, immediately turned over to his crew under uh, uh, Captain uh, 
Deke Parsons, who's the weaponeer for the project, and they've got to figure out how to put the pieces together, which some or more of them are flying in, actually, from the West Coast. They've got to figure out how to put them together, get them inside this B-29, and prepare to deliver them, deliver them against Japan. Uh, the other part of the hand receipt center, it's not just Farrell's uh, receipt of it. He also has to certify expenditure of the item. That's hmm. another piece of this. You don't just get a bomb. You actually have to expend it, and you've also got to prove it was expended. And, of course, the bureaucracy is not going to accept the fact that you've got all this evidence of destroyed city. Other stuff, you actually have a signature on a hand receipt that says it was used. So just I, in case we had any doubts about what had caused that could have destruction. Been, that's and, right. and somebody's got this, like, in their in the back of their truck, um, yeah. hold, holding on to it for Of course, for Hiroshima later. could have been destroyed by some natural disaster or something, I guess. But anyway, so on the other side, of the, on, the other, on, the, on the annotations on this, in one corner it says, by direction of Fleet Admiral Nimitz, who was in charge of the Marianas, the expenditure of this item is approved. That was signed on the, by his chief of staff on the morning of the mission. And then there's a little annotation from, uh, from Parsons, who was the weaponeer, of course, like I said, who armed the bomb and verified its use. 6 August 1945, I certify that the above material was expended to the city of Hiroshima, Japan at 0915, 6 August. W.S. Parsons. So that, 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 you know, that completes the chain of custody right. and asserts that the thing was actually used. Okay, so this is a pretty rich historical artifact. Um, it tells a, a really interesting story uh, of part of the atomic program, which is certainly a watershed moment in human history. And it's really surprising to me because you say this is... This is in his wallet. This, he carried this in his wallet for many, many years after the after the fact. This was the um, the original had to be returned to the sender to verify right. the bomb had actually been used. The duplicate was retained by the recipient, and a triplicate was put in suspense file. So this was the recipient's recipient's duplicate that he kept in his wallet. Do we is are there copies of this in other places in the U.S. archives that we know of? This or? is the the only one we're aware of is this one. Oh was, wow! That was in Farrell's papers. That's, so even even then, like sometimes you know, I guess sometimes people know that they're a part of history, that they're a part of something, right, bigger than themselves, and and sort of truly momentous in the history of humankind. And so I, I guess we should we should be less, um, maybe more careful about what we throw out, or what we what we keep. And what else, what other, the other thing that Farrell did is is he act, act, he knew how important the document was, so he actually also he has a corner. In the other corner, he has what he calls witnesses, and he went, went around and got signatures of the people he was working with on Tinian who were also involved in the project to kind of retain their their names on the document as well. So he, he made this into a more of a record than actually it was with the pure hand receipt. Right, a, a, a truly a documentary record of, of what, what happened that day and, and yes. how it came to be. So we, we know this has an important place in the atomic history of the United States, in the military history of the United States. Are there other reasons that you think the document is historically significant? Well, it, it if you want to, it, you could call it a monument to bureaucratic inanity. I'm not quite sure why we need a, a hand receipt to prove that we expended an atomic bomb on a city. But at the same time, it does show Farrell's appreciation for the importance of it. I mean, it, they knew at the time how important this was. Um, and there's all kinds of other little stories that come off it as well. You've got, uh, for instance, this comes over in the USS Indianapolis which drops off on the 26th of July, it drops the bomb off. Immediately, his heads back to Leyte to, for its next mission is sunk by a Japanese submarine because it not only mm-hmm. it was a, it didn't have any sonar, it wasn't zigzagging because nobody thought there was much of a threat. It gets sunk, about, about 1,200 people on the ship, about 850 get in the water. No one knows the ship is missing because they expect they, they weren't, that everybody assumed it was going on to Lady on its own. It was kind of a secret mission. There wasn't a lot of knowledge about it. The the sailors spent three days in the sea getting eaten by sharks, and by the end of by the time they are found, there's only three hundred some left. It's a pretty you know you wonder what happened if that Japanese submarine had spotted the ship going into Tinian right. instead of coming out. History may have been very different. Yeah, that there are always these moments of contingency, right, where something could have gone a different way, or or a, a minor event can have sort of outsized impacts on on what happens later. I guess as a as a historian, I'm really happy that we have monuments to bureaucratic inanity <laughs> because it leaves it leaves documents, right? It leaves this this pa- literally this paper trail um, where we can see the people involved and we can see the um, the processes and the the ideas and the language 
that are that are sort of being used and at the same time it is it, it's a very odd thing um <laughs> right because the hand receipts are just so routine and they're um this is not routine and this one is is simply um simply not <laughs> so other than an antiquarian interest other than an interest in just old things um what can we learn from this hand receipt what are the takeaways do you think for today's senior leaders well one thing I, it strikes me is the people involved in this knew how important it was um you know parsons was actually a uh, became a uh, technical advisor for the movie above and beyond which is supposed to be the movie about the dropping of the atomic bomb and one of the things he complained about in the movie was when the movie drops the bomb, this movie's done in the early 50s, and when the movie ha- shows the crew dropping the bomb, they're all looking with this, these, these, these visions of angst and these, you know, oh, my God, as they see the bomb go off. And he really complained with the movie people and said, that's not the way it was. We all realized we were, this, this was the, the weapon that could end the war. We could win the war mm-hmm. with this bomb. He said, we weren't remorseful. We were, we were happy. We, we think we, we thought we were ending the war. We knew how important it was. And that's reflected in this document, how important it was. It's interesting. The answer he got from the movie producers was that this was in the 50s in the middle of the Cold War. And they said, we couldn't have a bunch of Americans killing thousands of Asians and, and looking like they enjoyed it because it would look with, bad. With no war. moral sort of qualms or uncertainties right. whatsoever. It would look, make us look bad in the Cold War. But, but Parsons, everybody, everybody at the time knew how important this event was and tried, wanted to record it as best they could. And again, it was so important to Farrell, like, like we've said, he carried this around in his wallet for mm-hmm. the rest of his life. Yeah. So there's, there's something about sort of recognizing the, the significance of the events that maybe you're, you're involved in. I'm reminded um, in today, actually, just in class, we talked about the sort of homo bureaucraticus model of decision making. And this, we often think about bureaucracy as being inefficient and slow and bad and a pathology that that prevents good decisions. Um, but here, even 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 though it, it is sort of inane and, and, and perhaps even a little bit absurd, um, we see, I think, some of the things that bureaucracy brings to the table, which is a sense of order and expertise and a way of doing things uh, and an assurance that that processes are going to be followed, uh, even for something as momentous as the the dropping of a new kind, new kind of weapon. And and for those of us that have been involved with with nuclear weapons and other forms, as I have with my my early Nike Hercules background when I was a lot younger than I am today, uh, it also is another sign of the, um, the the care we take with it with this, these particular mm-hmm. tools of warfare. I mean, it's 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 still the same today. We all know the accountability for these weapons is 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 intricate and detailed, and uh, it, it, it's it's above and beyond what they are in a lot of other fields. Zero, very much zero defects, and it was then as well. I mean, from the beginning, we've always known how important these weapons are, and how dangerous they are, and how much they'd be taken care of. And this this chain of custody is enough, is another example of that. Right. We really took proper care of these very deadly items. Well, when, when we think about the sort of close call nuclear incidents in American history, especially so many of them revolve around misplaced or misfiled paperwork or missed inspections or right sort of simple procedural and process oriented mistakes that could have had mm-hmm. really truly dire consequences. So you think that that's got to be the case all the way back to the beginning of the atomic age. And I think that so that culture seems to to have carried forward, and probably rightly, rightly so that we want to be very careful with these uh, weapons of of mass destruction and and war. Any last thoughts or? I guess you know there's a caution for all of you out there who are listening to this that, you know that think about what you're doing every day. Think about the document you have. You never know what what item you put in your wallet today may become a. A, something of great value for those of us those historians and archivists looking at it in the future. Yes, think think of think of the historians. You know, uh, fifty years from now or a hundred years from now, uh, and what might be interesting and what might be uh, really illuminating. I think I'm always surprised when I go to the archives and and what I find, uh, and I'm always very glad that people saved the things that they did. Could be a twist on that one commercial. What do we have in your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. On that note, we'll close out for today. Thanks for listening and thanks for joining us at the War Room Podcast. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.